Brainwashing is interesting not only because it lies at this centre between neuroscience, between politics, between history, between psychology, but it also is interesting because it speaks to a very, very deep and ancient human desire. <clears throat> when we grow up, we learn that our bodies are under our control and that control, for most of us anyway, seems effortless and rather mystical, rather magical. You know, you move your hand and it, and it just moves, just like that, it's so easy. And then you meet these other people and they just won't. You know, you can't control them like you can control your own body. And there's the tension there because other people are always have their own agendas, their own goals, and you cannot control them and make them do what you want. And, you, you know, that's frustrating, that's annoying. It's a source of trauma, if you like. So that dream of mind control is very old. And brainwashing taps into that because it offers you a quick fix. The idea that you might have some pill or some magic process that might make you able to bend others to your will. Now, obviously, actual brainwashing is a heck of a lot of hard work. You really have to struggle. You have to take these people away. You have to isolate them. You have to work really hard to get your messages into their heads and make them stick. Especially make them stick because quite a lot of the veterans who came back with apparent brainwashing did not actually stay brainwashed. What happened was that they tended to develop high rates of mental illness. And this is a dangerous technique as well as being a not very effective one. What's interesting now, and this has really emerged even since I wrote and published Brainwashing, what's actually happening now is that for the first time neuroscience is getting to the stage where it's starting to look as if we might understand the underlying brain mechanisms of what's going on, for example, when we experience strong emotions, when a message is repeated again and again and learned in the brain, when uncertainty and cognitive dissonance challenge our ideas about what we thought we believed and when we're isolated and our environment is controlled. So neuroscience is beginning to offer possible quick fixes for the idea, you know, of the problem, if you like, of mind control. Now this is interesting because mind control is a dream of healthy young people. It comes about at that age, the teenage age, if you like, when you're physically at your fittest for most people and when your body seems invincible and when your control seems all-powerful over your body. Now those of us who've had physical ailments and who are a little bit older know that your bodily control is not perfect. It doesn't last. Mind control seems less appealing to us but for young people it's a great dream. Now if you had a science that was able to deliver that, that was able to look into a living brain record its patterns, attach those patterns to meanings in a sense so that we could read minds and then perhaps even develop, for example, genetic techniques which can manipulate, change the brain such that you can change a person's mind. That's going to be an awfully tempting proposition. And this is why I think understanding what brainwashing is, where it comes from, how much of it is real and can be analysed in scientific terms and how much of it was just the hype and the political exaggeration and the needs of that particular era. I think that's really important because that will help us to see more clearly what's going on now and perhaps it will help us not to follow possibly unwise dreams without really understanding what we're doing. That I think is why brainwashing is a really interesting and important topic.